Hello, and welcome to another episode of the William Branham Historical Research Podcast. I'm John Collins, the author and founder of William Branham Historical Research at william-branham.org. And with me, I have my co-host, researcher, minister, and friend, Charles Paisley, the founder of ChristianGospelChurch.org. And together, we're examining the history and the intersections in history between William Branham and other key figures that either influenced or were influenced by the post-World War II healing revivals. Charles, today we have a packed episode. This, there's almost no way that we can fit all of this information into one single episode, but we're going to try. Yes, I know, John. We, we've got a boatload to cover, and I, I think, uh, as I was thinking about it uh, the last couple of days, may, hopefully maybe we can focus on uh, two or three highlighted cases, <clears throat> get, show some good evidence for that, and uh, our, hopefully our listeners will be very excited to hear what, what we got to share. I know today we're going to be looking into when William Branham came into contact with Roy Davis and got his start in ministry. That's a lot to pack into one episode. Yes, and I will never forget when I first discovered who and what Roy Davis was. This is the deepest, darkest secret of the message cult following, and we had literally no idea. No idea. idea. And, and, And I'll just hold up the pictures real quick, right off the bat. Roy Davis is pastor. His picture advertised in William Brown's magazine. Roy Davis, the imperial wizard of the Ku Klux Klan. Uh, It's the same man. Right. It's such a fascinating history. In fact, just this single man makes my research and my websites get a lot of attention from even non-religious people because this is a sinister character in American history. Yeah. It's, uh, It's really something, John. You know, it, it it still disturbs me to this day the facts that have unearthed in this line of uh, <laughs> this line of reasoning and research the things that we found. I think this is for me uh, the part of the message that when you find it out, it makes you feel dirty, John. You right. feel dirty that you that you had been influenced by some of this stuff because it is so sinister. Right. So uh, so many bad repercussions came as a result of it. Yeah. And it's tied to some, in American history, it's tied to some very critical milestones in American history that are, you know, scars on America, uh, scars on America, right? When I first came in contact with this information and started researching, I literally could not have pieced it together without a historian who is deeply involved in studying the assassination of President John F. Kennedy. Not that Roy Davis was the assassin, but Davis was there and literally was helping create the scenario that enabled the assassination. He was involved in the protest. We actually have video footage of Roy Davis processing in front of um, the theaters there in Dallas. Yeah, I know when when Kennedy died, it definitely was not uh, a sorrowful event, I guess I'll say it to these people. The death of Kennedy was celebrated by all of these men uh, when that happened. Uh, and so it, it really was a, a very sinister end. Remember, Kennedy was the first Catholic president, right? So right. back to uh, one of the enemies of the Klan. Uh, you know, Roy Davis, uh, when we grew up in the message, John, uh, we had no idea that the roots of the message went back to Roy Davis and the white supremacy views and the Ku Klux Klan. Um which, which we're going to talk about a little bit in this episode. We had no idea that that was there. However, some of that ideology that William Branham learned there carried into the message and was still taught to us, but it was taught in a uh, kind of somewhat disconnected from the history of where it came from. And I know at some point we're going to look forward to getting into a little bit of those teachings themselves and where they came from. Um, but, uh, Yeah, with William Branham's conversion story, maybe let me share his official story, and then we'll kind of go into what we know really did happen. That's a good idea. So, so in his official story, you know, in all of the uh, in all of the materials that you get from the group, that's that's the uh, official or the accepted public version, the quote unquote official version. Yeah. So, in the official version, so uh, kind of picking up from where we left off last time, William Branham had left Indiana, and we looked at the things that had been happening at the time that he left Indiana. You know, a lot of very criminal, suspicious things had went on when he left. He left Indiana, um, and 
In his official story, he goes to Arizona. He stays there until he hears about the death of his brother. His brother, Edward, died in uh, June, I think, 1929. Um, and then he comes back to his brother's funeral. Uh, at his brother's funeral, uh, in one telling, he says that's the first time in his life he ever even heard a prayer <laughs> in right. one of his one of his many versions of his story. And after the funeral, his parents convince him to stay at home, help take help with the family. Uh, and so he does, and he takes a job working for the public service company, which is the electric company in Indiana. And uh, about two years later, he has a near-death experience working on the job. He hears a voice talking to him that starts him on a spiritual journey. Um, he ends up going and praying by a woodshed or a garage in his backyard. The pillar of fire comes to him that's followed him all his life, according to his story. And he's filled with the Holy Ghost. He's saved, born again. And this angelic being, this pillar of fire, the Holy Spirit, whatever it is, leads him through Jeffersonville to the church of Roy Davis, where he joins Roy Davis, baptizes him about six months later, ordains him as a minister. So that's the official version. Right. Um, he came back to Indiana in 29. He was uh, baptized, converted in 1931, roughly the middle there, and became a minister about six months later. Right. And as you're listening to this, if you've been indoctrinated in this type of religion, he's telling the story about how he was converted and sent to Roy Davis's church. And in your mind, you're thinking, and and the lights, the heavens opened, and the angels and choir sang, and you're you're really envisioning the spiritual journey to a spiritual place. Right. It's it's not anything like what we're about to discuss. And um, you know, William Branham. He paints this picture in your mind of his conversion story and these angelic visitations. And that picture in your mind is literally dependent upon which version of that story you're hearing because the details shift and change across different versions. That's correct. You know, depending on which group or time he was telling that story, quite a few of the details of that vary. Um, right. So I, I tried to stick with... Uh, the official version where I came from, too, because there's certain details in the books that we never really believed either, right. you know, but that's kind of more or less well, how I believe it. Was there any differences in how you were taught that or told that growing up, John? <clears throat> I'm a little bit unusual because I had the entire collection of tapes and I listened okay. to them constantly. I There were days when I would listen to three or four a day. It wow. was that that many. And I I want to say I started at probably age goodness, it's probably age 14, and then went, you know, well into my marriage. I was listening to these things every day. So what happens whenever you believe something is 100% true down to every detail, and all the details vary, your mind through cognitive dissonance begins to merge those details. Mm -hmm. So I believed what you just said. I believed what the other people who have a different version say, and I, I literally believed all of it. And only after I left this, I started to piece together, well, no, he told the story one way to this location and told the story differently to another location. Yes, yes. Uh, it, it's amazing how uh, when we're on the inside, we don't see these really glaring, obvious red flags, right? Right. Uh, and when everyone around you believes it too, you know, it. why wouldn't you, right? I mean, you have, there's not even a, there's not even something to trigger a, a, a reason to even question it, right? But hopefully we're saying some things <laughs> in these last few episodes that'll be a catalyst for some people to ask some questions, right? Um, you know, one one of the really strange things with with this story, though, is one of the problems we we found with it. You found with it, especially John, is that we have pretty strong evidence that William Branham was actually traveling with Roy Davis on his his campaign tours or whatever he would call them, his revival circuit before mm -hmm. 1931, when he supposedly met him at his church in Jeffersonville. Right. And from all appearances, Roy Davis was creating a new religion. It was called the Pentecostal Baptist Church of God sect. Um, we'll get deeper into this as we go into the history, but Davis had been ousted from the 1915 Ku Klux Klan. He tried to create other white supremacy groups, which, you know, fizzled out, but his religious side did not fizzle because Davis was a key figure in the fundamentalist religion of his era. 
he was um, he was actually quite famous. He had a radio broadcasting program. Uh, I right. think it was called Jack and Granny. Right. It was a national program. You know, a national all over the program. US. Um, in fact, I came across recently some research. Um, you know, here in Louisville, we had the National Quartet Convention when I was in the message, and all of the yeah. quartets would gather, and they would right. sing, and it, it was a big, wonderful thing if you're a you know a Christian and you like this type of music. Well, I've been there a few times myself. <laughs> right. You know, Davis was the MC for the equivalent of the National Quartet Convention back in, I think it was the 1940s, yeah. and they announced that he was a member, a founding member of the original Stamps Quartet. I know, that's incredible, isn't it? As we grew up listening to the Stamps, I did, certainly, you probably did too, John. Yeah, yeah. I did too. Yeah, J.D. Sumner and the Stamps. But And who knew, you know, he was so embedded into all these things. Roy Davis was like a, a jack of all trades. He was a man of many hats. I mean, there's even newspaper articles, I think, we with him with Pancho Villa, right? I mean, yes. <laughs> the stuff he did, it, it, I mean, it's... <laughs> It, 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 it's you, a movie writer couldn't even make it up, the life that he lived. It's just incredible, you know. He had multiple wives and multiple cities and was living this. I think he had five or six different lives he was living at the same time. It's just an incredible, incredible story. Before we get into that, so I want to cover that history. And like I say, we're, we'll do good to fit this into one episode. But <laughs> I first want to paint into the minds of the listeners who don't understand the complexity of this issue. For example, in William Branham's cult of personality, there are many people that say that, you know, yes, William Branham was connected to all these people. Yes, William Branham may have done some very bad things, but look at the people that he saved and he pointed to Christ. Look at the people. I've ha actually recently had a person contact me and say, why are you doing this? I literally came to Jesus Christ because of William Branham. He's a good man, not a bad man. The man that we're about to discuss, Roy E. Davis, beyond any shadow of a doubt, is a villainous, evil person, a right. criminal. Uh, I cannot say even enough bad things about this guy when you understand yeah. who he is and what he did. Yeah. He, he served in jail. He served multiple prisons in jail. He was arrested dozens of times. I mean, the stuff he did right. is, is terrible. So here is an article from Oklahoma during Davis's revival circuit. I will, um, you know, make the screen a little bit better so that people can read it, but it's called Great Revival at Schultz being held by Reverend Davis. And people of that era who, if they came in contact with some of these criminal things that Roy Davis was doing, they would say the exact same thing. They would say, but Davis saved me. I was saved by Roy Davis. He brought Jesus to me. And they're literally putting a mediator in between God and man, lifting up a, in this case, a very evil person as the mediator who saved them. But it reads, one of the greatest, if not the greatest religious waves that have swept through this part of the country was begun two weeks ago by Reverend Roy E. Davis, now conducting the revival at the meeting in Schultz. Reverend Davis has been open in his condemning every form of evil, uh, fearlessly yet in a spirit of love. His manner of preaching is the most unique. He never fails to hold up Christ as the only remedy for fallen men. Christ is his theme, and a great number have melted under the power of the gospel as delivered by Mr. Roy Davis. Yeah. You know, it, they they hijack Christianity, true Christianity, right? Right. And they mix in the things that they want to achieve, and they use that as a vehicle um, for very nefarious things, right? You know, if Jesus was here today, John, I don't think he would be behind a white hood uh, lynching people, right? <laughs> I don't believe so. Okay. Or, in, or instigating a mass lynching. You know, yes. Davis may not have done the lynching, but he provoked several people to kill people. Yes, exactly. You know, or as Jesus said, uh, put on my preacher hat, he says, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, then would my servants rise and fight. Right. Says, but my kingdom's not from here. So we, you don't rise and fight in this world, right? So it's a, it's a very messed up view, a completely 
anti-Jesus view that these people take uh, when they've got to resort to violence to bring about the the things that they want to do in this in this world, which is just it's awful. And yeah, yeah so Roy Davis is doing all these terrible things, and he's having these these revivals, um, and. We know he's not doing this alone. We know other high-ranking clan figures are also working with him in that project, right? Uh, Caleb Ridley was was one such figure. Mm-hmm. Um, and as Roy Davis was, was going about trying to start this first Pentecostal Baptist Church of God, he had Caleb Ridley, um, the Imperial Club, the national chaplain of the clan, working side-by-side side with him um, to, to help get this denomination off the ground. And somewhere through all these tours, Roy Roy Davis has also got William Branham along with him, right? And at, as you go down, let, maybe let me just show a few articles to John. Just So here I have a, just an article on who Caleb Ridley is. Uh, so this is showing uh, when Caleb Ridley resigned from the Baptist Church. And it's very clear here. It mentions how he is uh, ranking the chaplain of the Klan. But... He starts going on these tours with with brother uh, with well, Roy Davis. I don't want to say brother Roy Davis, <laughs> <laughs> but Roy Davis, right? And uh, they start traveling around the country. And the thing is, we William Branham shares some details of his tours when he's traveling with Roy Davis in his sermons, right? Right. And we have a pretty solid idea of Roy Davis's revival schedule. Uh, through that period from a lot of the research that we've done. And, and you've been able to bring up and get the articles from some of these, new, from some of these uh, revivals that William Branham said that he was at, right? And from a pig in a stroller. <laughs> a pig in a stroller. This sounds crazy. So William Branham, when he, when he starts talking about holding revivals with the Reverend Roy Davis, he called him Dr. Davis. Yeah. And... Um, I had, uh, at that point in time, I had Davis's revival tour. I knew exactly where he was. And I could see, you know, he's holding revivals, with, as you say, with Caleb Ridley. Well, William Branham talks about holding a revival with Roy Davis. And he says, I think it was in Memphis. And so in my mind, I'm thinking, well, he, you know, even then I knew he was not always telling the truth, but I thought, why would he lie about the locations, right? So I was thinking, I need to sometime go to Memphis, and I actually took a trip to Memphis. And, you know, I, there's just no way to tie that old of history to William Branham. Well, one day, I took my children and my family, my wife and kids, to uh, Nashville on a miniature vacation. And we stayed um, in a hotel there. And a friend of mine recommended that I go see the Nashville Parthenon. I'd never been. And as I'm walking up, there's, <laughs> there's, there was a lady pushing a stroller. And I look, you know, I could see over her shoulder. I could see the stroller, and it looked like a baby. And um, I, I leaned over, and I said, oh, it's, it's so cute. And then, no joke, it's a pig. <laughs> it's a literal <laughs> pig in the stroller. And um, apparently this was a famous pig, and they had a podcast where they – um, you know, she took the, the pig to various places and took photo shoots with the pigs. Well, the photo shoot opportunity, I'm standing here and I'm looking at all of these things that she's going to be photoing the pig with. And, oh my gosh, this is the exact place that William Branham mentioned on mm-hmm. that sermon. I'm literally standing where he and Reverend Davis were during the revival with Caleb Ridley, the Imperial Clud of the Ku Klux Klan. Yes, John, and that that's an amazing fact. You know, that just that story alone lets us put a whole lot of people together. I actually have the quote here, and it's from uh, September 9th, 1962, that William Branham talked about that place. And I'll just read it. He says, and, and we was, went to a coliseum that they had there, but not a coliseum. It was kind of an art gallery where they had the great statues from the different parts of the earth, Hercules and so forth. And he's he's confident it's in Tennessee. Mm-hmm. And he's talking about the Nashville Parthenon, John. That's right. exactly what he is describing. And he goes on to talk about uh, some of the sermon and the stuff that was preached there. And there's enough details there that we can go back through what we know about Roy Davis's revival tour, and we can find that meeting. Right. Um, and that meeting happened, surprise, surprise, years before 1931, right? When when he was supposed to be uh, 
officially converted in meeting Roy Davis. Right. And uh, I don't. I actually printed off a couple of the newspaper articles, John, about that that specific revival. Um, one of them here is. Um, uh, let's see here. Here's one of the revivals where Caleb Ridley and uh, Davis are working together. But here's the one I believe that's at the Nashville Parthenon, uh, where they right actually, on the lawn. Exactly right at the very place. This is this is the revival that William Branham is describing um, in that quote from 1962, and it tells us very clearly where it's at. Roy Davis is leading it. Caleb Ridley is speaking at it, and these are all high-ranking white supremacist clan figures at this yes. meeting that Branham's having in 1929, three years before, <clears throat> three years before all these books tells us that he was converted at Roy Davis's church in Jeffersonville. Right, and back to you know the revival circuits, the ri- revival tours, like this great revival being held at Schultz. These were people that he was basically, Davis was building a church. He was, he was um, wanting to create, literally it was a political cult instead of a religious cult, but he was wanting to create this face of a religious cult so that underneath of all of this religion, he could plant the seeds of white supremacy. And that's why he and Caleb Ridley were connecting together and, and spreading this. This was literally the early grounds of his formation of a cult. And here's William Branham in 19, what was it, 1926. Here's William Branham with them as they're creating the cult. Yeah, so somehow, after the, you know, the things we talked about in the last episode, William Branham ends up with this crowd of people traveling around, especially the southern United States, um, participating at, in some level in these revivals that are going on. And, right. and the, the thing about this revival here with um, in Nashville, this one we're talking about specifically, this one was actually about one month after William Branham's brother Edward died, right? Right. Um, which, again, is well before he said that he had met Roy Davis and had converted. And there's another thing about... The brother, Brother Branham's brother, William Branham's brother, uh, Edward. And when he came back to Jeffersonville, um, he he never really told us, you know, the circumstances of his brother's death. But what right. had happened is William Branham's brother, Edward, had murdered a man. Yes. Right? So William, his brother, Edward, had been charged with murder. So after he left town, his family, it actually seems to have stayed involved with crime and the criminal things in Jeffersonville. And and he came back to their funeral, and within roughly six weeks of that funeral, we can place him, for example, at this event in Nashville, Tennessee with Roy Davis. So we also have evidence that he was with Roy Davis for months or rather years before that as well in the early 20s, right, John? Yeah. I will never forget, as I was doing my research, the way that I started putting all of this together was I started creating a timeline of William Branham's, um, you know, what he says, which is very difficult because his timeline shifts and changes. And, you know, even the details in the timeline cannot coexist. But I noticed that there was this huge gap in the timeline and during the period when he's literally starting this church with Roy Davis, there, there are all these missing years. And I was trying to figure out why are these years missing? What was he doing? And as we talked about in the last episode, here is William Branham with his father running whiskey or creating whiskey in the still. They're working with the liquor kingpin, with basically with the mob in Jeffersonville. All of this criminal investigation happens. William Branham leaves. Well, if you now that we're filling in this timeline, he leaves and then he's working with Roy Davis in the Klan. Yeah. yeah, so he's he's got out of town with them, and you know maybe he's escaped this life of crime and got away from <laughs> got away from that kind of crime and went to another kind, maybe. <laughs> uh, but there's also this weird. Um, situation going on. I, I use the term loosely, the Klan. He was working with the Klan. Yeah, because white supremacist. White supremacist. See, Davis... It's a variety of groups, right? A, a variety of groups. Davis and Ridley were ousted from the Klan, yes. but they... It was, it, was a, uh, it was like a purging 
and the original people who created the clan were all ousted. And so they felt like they had the original clan core values. So they were trying to basically recreate the clan, which they did later. And Roy Davis named it the original Knights of the Ku Klux Klan. So he was building a sect of the clan that he said was the original because the sect that he, the basically the sect that took over the clan was ousted all of the original people. Right. Exactly. And you know, when, when, when Hiram Evans took over, um, William Simmons, the original founder, was out. Roy Davis was out. Roy Davis actually was uh, attacked and beat by a mm-hmm. group of men at that time, right? So it was probably connected. Caleb Ridley ends up out as well. So all of these, at this point, former high-ranking members of the Klan itself are, are building this new organization, John, that you mentioned. Right. When you read the newspaper articles, it talks about they had retained the loyalty of tens of thousands of Klan followers, followed them over into this new white supremacist organization they were trying to set up. Yeah. And and this, it really seems like this first Pentecostal Baptist church was the religious front, the religious side of this new white supremacist organization yeah. that they were building. And we know from the newspaper articles, we know that Davis was um, very active in promoting the Klan. It's, it's not as if William Branham joined into this thing that Davis was doing and was completely unaware. It was even in the newspapers advertising that Davis had strong affiliations with white supremacy. Exactly. And we have historical records of other cities where he is basically running the Klan operations from his church and gets ousted from those churches. So it was definitely a Klan operation. Right. And, and there is no chance that William Branham did not know who this man is. And there's one there's one certain article in the news, John, that actually kind of kind of did it for me that there's no way William Branham did not know what he was involved in. And and it's actually um, I'll, I'll hold them up here. Just two newspaper articles from Jeffersonville. Um, and in Jeffersonville, Roy Davis was arrested off of the platform mid service taken to jail, indicted. In the middle of the church service, this happened. In Jeffersville. Like right in front of William Branham. Branham would have seen Davis taken by the police officers. Exactly. And we know, you know, William Branham was, you know, the newspapers at this point are talking about that he was in Roy Davis's church. Here, this lists him as the worship leader in Roy Davis's church. So William Branham had to know... Because even these articles talk about all the people from his church following him over and um, pleading on his behalf at the yeah. court hearings and stuff. So th- it to me, it is impossible for me to f- think of a scenario where William Branham does not know what he's involved in, doesn't know that right. these things are going on. William Branham had to absolutely know. And, and this thing where right here where he was arrested, this is just one of how many times was he was he arrested? <laughs> I've lost in, count. <laughs> all right, and, and how many? I mean, just from the time we know William Branham was with him, even even if you take William Branham's official story of the years that he was with him, William Branham was officially with William Branham when this happened. William Branham was with, officially with, Roy with with Roy Davis when he was arrested mm-hmm. off the platform in front of him, right? Yeah. Even even if you tie that into his official biography, and yeah. and there's a huge history that we're we're skipping over for sake of time, right? Yeah. It wasn't just that Davis came to Jeffersonville and was al- arrested from the platform and was a big surprise to William Branham. There is also a Louisville history that I have yet to place a date on. I know that Davis had started. Uh, See, the Pentecostal Baptist Church of God was a sect of Christianity. It was not a single church. He had multiple churches in multiple states. One of those states was Louisville, was in Kentucky, in Louisville, Kentucky. And it's just right across the river, literally less than a mile from where William Branham lived, right, as a child. And there's this weird thing that happens. Remember... William Branham is involved in this liquor industry. He's at risk of being prosecuted. His father did go to prison for it. William Branham leaves. He joins in with Roy Davis, who's holding these Christian revivals. And these are, you know, I'm reading this article uh, from Schultz. These are Christian people who are praising Davis for acting and conducting himself as a very godly man. 
Yet we have the newspaper articles when he comes back to Lo- to Louisville, Kentucky, and he starts that church there. They would not describe it the same. Remember, he's coming back to where William Branham had basically worked with the mob producing liquor. He describes his church as filled with people on every Sunday who are coming in completely drunk. They're women who are sitting in the laps of men during his services. And again, this is during prohibition. If people were drunken like this, the the government would step in and try to find out where they're getting all of this liquor. This is a very unusual church that he's in in Louisville, and he is being arrested for sexual crimes for, it's called violation of the Mann Act, which is taking an underage girl across state lines for the purposes of sex. That was his crime and the biggest one of his many crimes in Louisville. Right, and that's the one he was arrested off the platform for, like you said. Right. And th- the thing is, it, it was all true, wasn't it, John? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> he he actually after afterwards he ends up taking that minor girl. Her name was Allie Lee Garrison to Mexico, and he married her. Right, yeah, so he really was he really was living with her immorally. Mm-hmm. Right, and there's th- no way that you can deny it at no, this point. William What's- Branham, yeah, when William Branham converted into this church, his pastor was having relations with an underage minor that he had been arrested for and taken to jail in front of William Branham. What in the world? Right. How do you, there's no excuse. William Branham knew about this. What's also interesting in the Louisville history, again, it's way more than we can cover in this one single episode. Yeah. But not all, but part of Davis's laundry list of crimes was exposed during this very public trial in Louisville. Mm -hmm. So if you're in Jeffersonville, where all of William Branham's family and uh, William Branham said he was at the time of all this is going, and you know now we know Dave, William Branham was with Davis and they were growing this church, so he would have been on the scandal side of this, not on the outside looking in. So he's on the scandal side of all of this you know, being exposed. Well, Roy Davis... He literally started his ministry in Texas in 1917 by robbing a bank. (laughs) He and his brothers, who came to Jeffersonville and held this revival, set up basically a scheme where they defrauded a bank and stole a bunch of money. And They had this thing where they'd write uh, fake checks, right? Like one of them would write a fake check to the other, and then the other would go pose as a preacher or whatever and cash their check for him. So it was a big scheme. And I remember reading the article of, you know, one of the bankers who cashed it. He said, well, I I had no clue that he would be, he would lie about signing this check because he was a preacher. This was a man of God. He just was taken completely by surprise. Yeah. So they'd they'd get the cash from the bank Mm -hmm. and then they'd leave town, right? And then the bank's out the money. And it was not just one town that they defrauded. Yeah. So they, Davis lived on the rails, and he had many churches throughout Texas, many churches from Texas all the way to Georgia. Yeah. And he would be preaching in a service and say, God has placed it upon my heart to go and evangelize. If you could contribute toward my ministry, I'm going to take a trip, and we're going to lead souls to Christ. Well, then he would go plant another church with that money and tell them that he was going to evangelize. And he had this whole string of churches mm-hmm. to the extent that in Georgia, he was living with a wife and was, uh, I can't remember, I think they did have children, a wife and children in Georgia. And it was a different wife and children that he had back in Texas. Yeah. Multiple families. Multiple families, multiple women that he's sleeping with. And those were not even the wives that were in his trail of violations of the Mann Act. There were yeah. multiple women. It's more women. Yeah, so there was no way that William Branham was not aware. This was a very public scandal, and William Branham was a leader in this sect. And as you as you come through, I mean, he was, we even have the newspaper articles, he was holding Klan rallies. Roy Davis was holding Klan mm-hmm. rallies in these churches, doing Klan recruitment in these churches. And even when he's, you know, in... In Nashville, at these meetings William Branham talks about, these people are doing white supremacist recruitment at these events. People have asked me, do you have hard evidence that William Branham was in the Ku Klux Klan? Well, 
I can't say yes because we have no record. There is this is a secret private organization. They sure. don't don't give the records. But William Branham was a leader in the sect that was created by high-ranking members of the Klan for the sole purpose of promoting the Klan. William Branham knew that they were promoting the Klan because we see all the newspaper articles where they are promoting the Klan. William Branham did not leave. So William Branham knew that they were in this very extremist terrorist organization, that they were posing as ministers, that they were criminals, and William Branham did not leave. So in my opinion, yes, he was definitely in the Klan. There's no way that William Branham was not in this Ku Klux Klan organization. Right, John. And now let me let me throw in some of uh, some of the stuff I know to that. So I know people who knew William Branham all the way back to the early 30s, right? So in the 20s, I don't know anybody who knew William Branham then, but I have known people who knew William Branham during this period of time now that we're talking about, right? And so wow. there's actually there's actually eyewitnesses accounts. I, I know multiple people who went to church with William Branham at Roy Davis's church. John. Really? Yes, John. Oh and, my gosh. Okay. So, so, I, I want to just tell you one of one person I I was at when I started asking these things. This person was a former is, is a message minister, you know, and I asked some of this stuff about William Branham, and I was told, "quote We were all in the Klan back then." Unquote. Wow. Yes, really? Yes. Justifying the stuff that that had went on, and so you know, again, for me, John, there is zero question that these people were involved in. The clan, you know, ex- mm-hmm. exactly what all they were doing, exactly the extent of it. I, you know, I, I, I can only guess, but there is not a doubt in my mind that at this point in William Brown's ministry, that not only was the church in Jeffersonville, he was at the Davis Church in Jeffersonville, that it had white supremacist clan members in it, but also the church over in Milltown. Um, where, which was also, we believe, planted, well, no, was planted by Roy Davis, and William Branham was there frequently, but the same thing, also had Klan members in it and was white supremacist connected. Um, that changes my thoughts. I, I remember when I first discovered the white supremacy aspect of William Branham's ministry, and I was talking to an old-timer who was in the Branham side of the sect, and I, I'll never forget this conversation. He was telling me, well, back then, everyone was in the Klan. And at that time, I thought he meant everyone, like the whole nation, the whole state, which I realize isn't correct. But based off of what you just said, he probably meant everyone in the church. He said back then, everyone was in the Klan. And he said the Klan did a lot of good things, which, you know, I can confirm there are some good things that the Klan did. There's but certainly this, some charitable activities, right? This was a terrorist organization. This was a domestic terrorist organization. And he says, but they did good things. Yeah, I, I'm sure we could say that the Klan did some good things in some ways, but Roy Davis did a lot of really terrible things, and that's who they were with. I mean, there's mm-hmm. there's just no way around it. Yeah, it's it's really hard to believe. So you knew people, and that... You know, that paints a much different picture of the early church than I had as a child. You know, this yeah. this is not at all what I expected. Yeah, so, it, you know, it's... I believed... You know, I can go through the stages of me coming to grips with this stuff. Like, I started out with, uh, all of this has got to be made up, John. <laughs> mm-hmm. And then I got to, con- then I got, well, Roy Davis was a scoundrel, but William Branham was just one of his many victims. Okay? Yeah. So I went through that. Then, you know, more stuff on my, like, oh no, that can't be right because William Branham knew and was doing these things and, and William Branham was still friendly with him to the day he died. And I will never forget the moment that I discovered <laughs> that the early church was actually teaching the racism. Yeah. So that paints, you know, that ties it all together even further. William Branham, it, and I was even sh- more shocked because William Branham teaches, as you know, the serpent seed doctrine. And right. we were taught this was the divine truth that he brought to the nation, not knowing that this was a very white, sup- white supremacist doctrine that he was teaching. And he says that he denied it whenever he was being taught that at the early church. 
Right. And and for me, as I look at all of these things, that to me is what mattered most to me as a message believer was when I realized there are certain things that we were still preaching in the church that William Branham had learned. Things I preached myself, John, God forgive oh, me. Oh, man. Um, that William Branham had learned from these white supremacists and told us he got it from God. And 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 we know for sure that he was preaching this white supremacy stuff. Now, I, this quote I'll read, I never preached nothing like this because I, 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 I never believed it. But, but when William Branham tells us that when he was at Roy Davis's church that he learned this stuff. And before I read this quote, I want to show you this article. Here's an article advertised in Roy Davis's church. And notice that one of the elders there is a brother, yeah. George D. Ark. Okay. William Branham's name is in this article too. And here's the quote. I'm just going to read part of it. William Branham claimed not to believe this at the time, but he told this to us. He said, the first time I ever met anyone in my life after I'd been converted, I met brother George D. Ark and them down there. That's Roy Davis's church. Right. And I was walked in, and the Lord led me to that little place, and they was discussing where the colored man came from. And they were saying that the colored man, that Cain married an animal like an ape, and there came forth the colored race. You know, mm -hmm. Branham told us personally that they were teaching white supremacist Christian identity themes at Roy Davis's church when right. he was there. Right. And so we have every... There is a multitude of witnesses on every level that William Branham was in a white supremacist, clan-affiliated church teaching terrible racist things from his early ministry. Yeah. And, you know, when William Branham rebranded the Christian identity doctrine of Wesley Swift and started calling it one of these divine truths, he whitewashed it. He tried to say that it wasn't about race, but when he introduced that doctrine, he also introduced this high-breeding doctrine, and it's the combination of the two that paints the full picture. You've got the idea that the serpent mated with Eve in the Garden of Eden and produced this evil bloodline, and he starts talking about this bloodline in, in that doctrine. Then in this other doctrine, this high-breeding doctrine, he starts talking about how if a black person breeds with a white person, the offspring is hereditarily evil for up to 10 generations cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. They're, it's that bad of an evil. So he's telling you basically that the serpent created this evil bloodline in this doctrine and that basically that bloodline is evil and they're black. And if you combine the two, he's literally talking about it. Now, that was the public face. We also have audio from the private face where there are leaders in William Branham's sect who openly taught the full and complete both doctrines combined where it was not so difficult to see. You know, I, I hope we can do a full version on the serpent seed at some point. But uh, suffice to say, you're exactly right. When, for the most part, when... Christian identity theology was taught publicly in message churches. They left out the word black and Jew, right. but they taught everything else the same. Uh, and it only, it, it didn't take much for the people sitting there to understand what they were saying. And if you were unrecept, you know, if you didn't get it, the preachers would fill you in. John, I, I think I've, again, let me go into personal, <laughs> personal mm. things. So after I became assistant pastor at our Jeffersonville Message Church. Um, at a certain point, our pastor, you know, uh, sets me down. John, this is this is hard for me to talk about. I'm sorry if I get a little emotional. You forgive me, but you know, as we as as I found this KK this stuff out, and I actually had went and asked the pastor a little bit about this stuff, and he sat me down one day and he told me, John, that that. Black people were the serpent seed, that interracial marriage is why God sent the flood. He told me that interracial marriage could only produce serpent seed. You know, he, he, he flat out told me Christian identity theology to my face, and he told me that's the secret. We can't tell it to everybody because not everybody can receive it. And then he told me 
that we had learned these things directly passed down to us from William Branham. This man was alive, attended the tabernacle with William Branham when he was alive, John. And, and you know, we have, we have these secret recordings on tape. Part of it, I know, a little bit has been shared here recently through your website, but we haven't even shared some of the most terrible part of it all, I don't think we actually put yeah. out. We're seeing a great breaking of the colored people today from the old spiritual spirit back a hundred years ago that they used to have. And now, brothers and sisters, they're taking on this modernistic spirit because I can see rising in the colored people today that same spirit of Nimrod. Not too long ago, a certain magazine published and showed pictures of different antiques and things that belong to the colored kingdom of ancient times, and that had to be Nimrod's hour. It lets me know as the Antichrist spirit moves in to try to unify everybody into one great brotherhood. You can't, brothers and sisters, put all races in the same bed. God didn't put all races in the same bed when Jesus Christ came. But I'll tell you one thing, the love of God in your heart can respect each race in his proper respective calling. The sad part of it is we have too many races today trying to outlive beyond what really their race is to be in the great universal earthly sphere of God's plan for the earth. My goodness, John. I, I'm sorry I get a little emotional. It's very hard for me to uh, to uh, to recall these things because, my goodness, I, I just... It's so awful, John. I didn't yeah. know until they told me, and then you're sick. You're just sick about it. Yeah, well, we didn't know. And, you know, that matches some testimony that I have that I've, I also have never shared because it's not something that I can prove and document. But in the mouth of two or three witnesses, my yeah. grandfather also, whenever a woman was we have a lot of um people from africa you know who came yeah. to the tabernacle and whenever a white woman would start to fall in love with one of these people from africa i remember my grandfather privately telling me that if they were to mate and they were to produce an offspring that offspring would be hereditarily evil and you couldn't trust it. I mean, basically, he, he was saying everything bad that you can say about this person. But not only that, their soul was damned to hell because of the color of their skin. That's something that my grandfather said. And, uh, you know, at the time, I thought, well, I, you know, I was indoctrinated in this religion. I did not even know this was racist to think this way. I believed it. I accepted it. And um, I... I, too, whenever I would see these kind of things happen, I would be harshly against it because that's what my grandfather said that William Branham said. Yeah. So th this is not just coming from your side of the sect. This was a very open doctrine by William Branham. I know. And and, and the thing is, is it, you know, it, it's okay to believe a fairy tale, you know, but Cinderella never killed anybody, you know, yeah. uh, uh, you know, uh, the fairy tales of, you know, the Brothers Grimm never killed anybody or never hurt anybody. I'll maybe say it that way. But th these things have resulted in great harm, John. And in my the church I came from, there was racially targeted discipline as a result of these beliefs that were carried out. And, it's, you know, at some point, you know, I will talk about these things maybe in a full episode but th these beliefs that came from this man Roy Davis the imperial wizard of the Ku Klux Klan the beliefs that came from him and his group that he taught to William Branham and William Branham learned from him are still believed and still having a negative impact in some I don't say all in some message groups today mm -hmm. you know and there's a whole lot of people that just have no idea about this. There's a lot of people that are completely oblivious to it. You know, like like I mentioned, when, when my pastor privately told me all of these things about the meaning of serpent seed, within a couple of weeks, he gets in the platform and he, j he just starts preaching it all up there. But the same thing, they don't say the word black, you know, they don't use that word in there. And, and, they'll, and they'll get to the point as they talk about it and they'll say, now you need to re read between the lines here and let the Spirit reveal this to you 
Yeah. Um, Cause he told me there's some things we can't say publicly cause not everyone can receive it. And I, and I'm looking around the church at hundreds and hundreds of people sitting here listening to him say these things. And not only that being broadcast to, you know, all of the remote fellowships around the world. And I'm just looking here, how many people here realize what he's getting at. Yeah. And some of them do and some of them don't. What's really sad to the listeners who were never raised in this message cult of personality, they're thinking, oh my gosh, this is the worst thing I've ever heard. I can't believe that this was a man posing to be a Christian was saying these things. Well, on the flip side of that, people who are indoctrinated with this thing, they're especially the white ones, they're thinking, well, what's wrong with that? What's wrong with keeping the bloodlines pure? This is a great and holy thing. And they they take pride in the fact that they're this way. And they say it doesn't hurt anything. But I have multiple friends who have black skin, who have left this cult. And they will be the first to tell you, yes, this hurts deeply. In fact, we just had a one of the escapees came to our house and we had dinner the other night. And... Um, he was telling me basically that he felt lower in status than all of the white people because, you know, it's, he's in a minority, especially here in the state of Indiana. There's not that many black people. So his pool of which to choose women of the cult as potential wives is very, very small. And he's thinking, why, why do they care what the color of my skin is? Why do they care that I, you know, my, I'm black and they're white? What's the difference? We're still human. And it deeply hurts if you're in the person who's being targeted with discrimination. It deeply hurts. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's an awful thing, John. It's a very awful thing. You know, we, we had so many things I could talk about. Yeah, there's so much. So this person Roy Davis that we're talking about is this extensive history. It doesn't just cover the timeline that we're talking about right now, the early years of William Branham. This is going to cover throughout throughout the rest of William Branham's ministry. He's going to be a recurring figure and we're going to get deeper into some of these criminal aspects. But um you know, obviously there's way more than we can possibly talk about in this single episode. Yes, definitely. So Roy Davis, one thing we can say for sure, John, with the stuff we've talked about here, William Branham was working with Roy Davis before his official conversion story admitted it. Roy Davis was a character <laughs> that was very bad. And for some reason, you know, William Branham hid all of this stuff about him from us. Uh, Yet, William Branham continued to speak highly of him and maintain a friendship with him until the day that he died. Until the day that he died. He did. He also tried to, he tried to distance himself by saying that Roy Davis and I had a disagreement in doctrine. But all while he's distancing himself, William Branham also knew his travel itinerary. And think of that. Who... Who but a high-ranking member would know the travel itinerary of the Imperial Wizard of the Ku Klux Klan? Exactly. And, and, and we have certainly all of these evidences that very early in his ministry he was working with Roy Davis. But, you know, when you get to articles like this, John, this is 1950. Right. And, and this is Voice of Healing magazine here. This is William Branham's, the publication that he started. And they're running articles publicizing Roy Davis in 1950. This is the height of the healing revival. Advertising Davis's healing revival is giving him some attention. And, and William Branham is still talking highly about this man on tape, even up into the 60s. Even up into the 60s when he's, when he's doing, when he's the imperial wizard of the Klan, William Branham is still talking highly of this man. Yeah, there's so much that we can go into with Davis, and it is, like I say, it is one of the most fascinating histories that um, we're going to be covering in this show. So if you're interested in hearing more, stay tuned. There's a lot more. That's right. If you've enjoyed our show and you want more information, you can check us out on the web. You can find us at william-branham.org and christiangospelchurch.org. 
for an overview of the historical research of William Branham and the healing revivals, you can read Preacher Behind the White Hoods, a critical examination of William Branham and his message, available on Amazon, Kindle, and Audible. Join us again next week. We've got a great episode coming. 